Hey, hey, hey. what's going on? Whew. A lot of running around there this morning. Are we live? Are we streaming? Meters are moving. Um, looks like we're on. End stream. That means that we've started streaming. Um, are you enjoying these streams? Is there anybody out there? Um, I should probably pull up YouTube on the on the computer. Oh, maybe not. Maybe not. I don't like looking at myself. What's going on out there? I've got the regular Strat. Well, it's a, uh, 59 custom shop style Strat. Today... I thought we'd pick a subject, maybe if you want to join in a conversation on it. People were asking about certain kind of opinions on things yesterday, which is kind of nice, isn't it? Because uh, we, we all like to kind of uh, express our uh, own individual outlooks on things. Um, and uh, I, was, I listened to that podcast, um, Word in Your Ear. Do you listen to that one by the two guys, Mark Ellen and... The other guy from, you know, Q Magazine and the Whistle Test and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they were talking about um, nobody's on the same string anymore. You know, what does that mean? Well, oh, by the way, I am going to do a bit of guitar playing and a little bit of teaching. You know what? There's like a, like, I'm like, just almost got to a point there and I went off on a tangent. But I'll just drop this here now. But I'm going to teach um, the last chorus of the Crossroads solo. So I'm going to teach the last chorus first and maybe what we might do is work our way back to the front because most people know the front end pretty good it's the back end they don't know and uh, i used to do have workshops in a, in a school of music in in town and uh, there's a guy called paul ballenbeck ballenbeck and he was like big jazz guitar player in new york dude and he did a workshop for me and one of the things he said was like actually once you've learned a tune relearn it but learn it backwards learn the last phrase of donnelly and then add the phrase before that it's a really nice way of kind of like thoroughly going through things so sometimes when you're learning the solo you know learn learn it from the back end and work back forward then you know the back end just as good as you do the front end so i'm going to do that as we go um and then if you want to ask questions about this topic that we're talking about are we on the same string we can talk about that at the same time as we go along and uh, but what are we on the same string what that means is like you know before the internet and the uber mega choices that we have now in media whether it's youtube or netflix it's like everybody's watching and discussing different things you know um so and then i was thinking but you know youtube people who are on my youtube channel they tend to like the the same thing so we've kind of found our own narrow little culture you know most people are here because they're interested in eric clapton <laughs> and blues rock and and stuff like that and learning guitar and talking about guitar so um but in the overall kind of culture you know we used to there was a i remember when hey uh, uh okay computer came out and there was a big buzz because it was the album after the bends you know by radiohead wasn't it and um remember the queuing for for those albums and it was the same when there was a new you know um a new album out by any artist really for when it from the from the 80s um you know it was like a big deal and everybody would make up their mind about it pretty quickly you know they'd love it or they'd hate it or the everybody would be discussing it you know even tv i remember when jaws was on the telly you know in um in the 80s you know and uh, everybody came to school the next day talking about jaws and the bit where robert shaw got bitten and off and it was pretty horrific when you were you know young you know so um please please feel free to uh drop some uh comments in on this um what was going to say so we're going to be jumping in and out of this topic as i teach this solo um here we go i need to find I need to find my own video and be watching it at the same time so I can talk about these comments. So uh, it's quite early, I know that. Um, in the States now, it's probably, um, it's probably what, one o'clock? So it's probably like eight in the morning or something, <laughs> which is a bit early for talking about rock and roll and such a subject. But um, 
you know, uh, why not? I think as the as the holiday period goes on, we'll, um, you know, I can st maybe do some later streams, you know. Uh, if I've not drunk too much, you know what I mean? <laughs> I've got a radiator here. I'm just warming my hand up. It's pretty cold and wet. A lot of rain. A lot of rain on the farm. A lot of big puddles forming. A lot of mud uh, this morning. So, um, I was going to say, hey, Mike, enjoying it. Hey, Pete Stern. Thanks. Uh, uh, big supporter of the channel, Pete Stern. Thanks for commenting. Um, so, yeah, what was I saying there? Yeah, as, a, as, the, uh, as the holidays progress and, um, you know, I might be able to do some kind of like late streams, like maybe like a one o'clock in the morning, which might make it, you know, maybe seven in the evening round your, your, you know, in the States or something like that. Because there seems to be most of the, the people enjoying these videos of, uh, from the States. Um, I know a few people from the UK uh, watch it and and other places. But um, anyway, we'll, we'll kind of roll with that. Um, is there who's who's watching and where are you from? Um, you know, drop a drop into the, the chat there. So, uh, the last chorus of Crossroads. I remember trying to learn this and just the opening phrase of this chorus, which slightly overlaps, feels like it overlaps from the chorus before, is really hard to hear, you know, but it's... You know, trying to hear that. So, there's a, a rhythm to it, which when you're just listening to the record, you just don't know where to break it up. It just sounds like a lot of, you know, rock and blues, you know. So, um... Can you see me okay there? Can you see the fingers? What's kind of interesting with this solo as well, which I do with students, is take it down the octave. And you really get inside it a little bit more, you know. And it's something, you know, you could use on in, in different uh, different tunes. And then you've got this kind of like double stop thing, which he does a lot on this song. And I use my second finger there a lot. And it's quite important that because I want to set up my third finger to go... And now we're into that vibrato thing we were talking about the other day so we've got this didn't do that very well but you can see the second thing there um hi aaron i'm currently working on that part of crossroads mike i actually know i remember yeah so um you, you actually came to mind when i was um when I was thinking about what to do today and I was thinking about regular viewers and, you know, Aaron, uh, Aaron is actually a student of mine and he's a, a fantastic blues guitar player. Um, and I knew you were working on this and I thought, well, this would be helpful for Aaron and it'll be helpful for, I mean, like one of the most, my most popular videos on YouTube is Crossroads. So, you know, I'm obviously trying to give people who have subscribed to this channel something which is meaningful to, you know, the reason they subscribed in the first place, which is, you know, relating to, you know, these classic Clapton solos and that. So, um, you know, so that little bit, if you took that down the octave. It's quite a funny jump that, isn't it? The, the way that he's decided in like this micro millisecond to go from this it's quite a you know separate two separate little kind of ideas you know and the fact that he's done that so seamlessly 
So, so far we've got Do you know? Um, it's super fast as well, isn't it? You know, so... Um, okay, let's go on to the next phrase. So, we've got this... Uh, we've got this... He does it three times. So, let's try again. You know, just taking it at, down the octave because it's the same, uh, you know, same notes. It doesn't sound like you're taking it somewhere which is going to mess with your ears you know but if the spacing is so different in this area of the neck isn't it we don't i mean like how often do you play exclusively on the you know 15th and 17th fret and 18th fret you know tend to play around here most of the time don't we you know um it's fascinating that he's just chose to just to do these three super fast choruses in that one position um for me it's just a absolutely brilliant immaculate solo um i think um uh what was it recently pete pete thorne maybe six months ago or something said on twitter you know what's the best guitar solo of all time and i dropped in crossroads and he didn't agree he didn't think i was right there but it's you know um that's that's fine um i suppose he would kind of lean more towards the the eddie van halen type of uh, things and that um but for me it's i think it's just because it's live you know obviously there's no kind of like splicing up solos and dropping in and that's the difference between um guitar solos today you never really know do you if it's kind of been played at a slower pace and sped up or it's been chopped or uh, spliced together out of five or six different solos. I know, I think Eddie Van Halen did that, didn't he? You do like five solos and then take the best, you know, like a jigsaw, he'd take the best licks out of each one and then he, that would construct his solo and then he'd go away and learn it and then try and play it uh, through. I don't know if that's true or not. Not all things that you hear are uh, rock solid. Um, am I an expert? You know what I mean? So it's kind of, uh, you know... Definitely not an expert on things like Eddie Van Halen. Anyway, um, let's uh, let's play up to there, will we? You know, this is this isn't like a, a normal lesson where I'm just you know this is me just having fun, giving you guys an opportunity to ask questions as we go. Um, Aaron, I agree with you, Mike. And how young Clapton was too back then when he did it, did the solo. Yeah, what was this? Sixty May eight was it? 68 so that would make him 23 <laughs> you know 23 and just the the uh, the fluidity and the power and the speed and just like you know when you've learned this solo and gone in pretty deep with it you know it becomes more and more fascinating because it's not relying on any real kind of like shapes or melodic it's just pure blues energy just completely on fire you know so um, here we go. Uh, let's take that. So. Okay. So do it one more time, shall we? It's that's the bit you've got to be able to sing in your head, you know. And then you've got this really cool uh, lick coming up next. Hang on, I've forgotten that now. So it's better if I don't look. I've got a little cheat sheet here because sometimes when you're under pressure, you just forget things. So I've got that to remind me. But if I don't look at it, I'm fine. <laughs> So 
so. Um, that's obviously a lick that you'd want to play around a little bit. And then the next lick is just like super cool because he's hammering into the major third like all the cool guns do. That's a great lick. That's one of, you know, that's just so super cool, isn't it? So, um... I actually don't want to work through this solo really quick. I'm going back to the Ronnie Corbett an analogy, you know, what he used to tell a joke. Actually, when I was a kid, I used to hate that. But now I I kind of appreciate it. You know, when you'd be watching the two Ronnies. This is probably, nobody probably knows what I'm talking about now. But I suppose if you're um, 50 and you know... Uh, you know you're a child of the 70s then you know what i'm talking about the two ronnies was a sketch show and uh, halfway through it ronnie corbett would sit in the black chair and he'd tell this really long joke but it'd take him ages to get to the punchline because he'd keep going off on tangents and stuff like that and then they always had a really crap uh, musical guest on when i say crap just not to my tastes at the time you know kind of like a, a lot of like show music like you know elaine page or something like that which is fine if that's what you like but um um i remember going oh no it's the the um it's the ronnie corbett joke which goes on for like 10 minutes oh no it's now elaine page singing something and you just want to get back to the silly stuff you know with uh ronnie barker and all that kind of stuff why am i making that analogy it's because like this I quite like the idea of these live streams being like that, where we can kind of chat about things and interact. And I, but you've got to ask questions, because if you're not asking questions, there's no point doing it. <laughs> um, and then I teach a solo, so you've got your guitar in hand, and you're talking about um, we're talking about guitar, we're talking about this solo. We can be talking about the the subject there, where I said, you know, are we on the same string? You know, if um, you know, like everybody back in the day watched those same sitcoms, didn't they? Everybody listened to the new Led Zeppelin album when it came out. Now, I'm not that old, actually. I remember when... Not a Led Zeppelin came out, but I remember when Now and Zen came out. You know, Robert Plant went to see that tour. Doug Boyle on guitar. What happened to Doug Boyle? Man, that's a name that you never hear. He was the guitar player with Robert Plant in the late 80s mid to late 80s fantastic player really really super uh, slick i remember me and my brother we went um around liverpool and, and my brother bought uh, uh we both bought a couple of books and i remember buying a pink floyd momentary lapse of reason tab book which is still around somewhere um and we the gig it was, it was It Bites supported. Do you remember It Bites? Calling all the heroes. Um, they didn't go down that well because it was a lot of, you know, rockers, hairy rockers, and It Bites were very, very accomplished, amazing musicians, but a bit kind of proggy and a bit kind of guitars under the chins, you know. Um, and so they, they got... Uh, they were actually brilliant because they were, they were a brilliant band, but maybe... The songs weren't as rock and roll as, you know, what Led Zeppelin obviously were known for. And everyone was there to see Robert Plant, you know, do his new tour for the Now and Zen. Um, but as soon as Robert Plant came on, everybody rushed down. This is in the Royal Court in Liverpool. Everybody kind of pushed forward. And, you know, me probably being like 13, 14 at the time, uh, right on the barrier. I remember the wooden barrier there in the Royal Court and then looking up and then these big hairy bikers were up here. It was like, how are they up there? And they were literally leaning on you, you know. Um, and luckily I had the, the momentary lapse of reason tab book to shove down my top and uh, that stopped my ribs getting completely crushed. <laughs> um, and we survived the gig, and it was a fantastic gig, uh, watching Doug Boyle kind of do his thing. Um, I must Google him. Or so, if you're kind of sat at home now, Google Doug Boyle and see what he's up to. Hope, you know, hope he's still with us. Um, so it's kind of a name I haven't actually uh, 
uh, thought of for a long time. But he was so he was a really kind of slip uh, guitar player, wasn't he? And I think that one of the guitar players Robert Plant uses now was a guy from um, Cast, wasn't he? Uh, it was Cast originally, and one of my friends actually played uh, with Cast for a while. He played. Uh, keyboards and stuff like that so I, I got to meet those guys a couple of times a really cool bunch of scallies great songwriters great band do you remember them cast from the 90s kind of like a brit pop band uh, but the guitar player who played with cast i think he's with robert plant now i remember at the time thinking man you've got loads of pedals and he was really into his gear and at that time i wasn't into gear at all i basically used a a tuner, a tube screamer, and a Ibanez AD9 delay pedal. That was, and I remember looking at his rig, and it was just like spaceships full of vintage, uh, amazing stuff. And it did sound fantastic, sounded uh, really good. But maybe a little bit kind of lost as well, because when you're playing these kind of festivals and outdoor, everything kind of turns to mush, especially if you're using um, time based. Uh, time-based effects a lot one of my personal gripes is that really is like going to see a band and uh the guitar player just uses too much reverb and too much delay um see clapton walk out you know a couple of tweed fenders turn it up no reverb architectural reverb is there so why you don't need it and and the clarity is much much cleaner isn't it it's much clearer um you know i remember going to hyde park there a couple of years ago and uh watching clapton and you know it was the one where he was the on the same bill was guy gary clark he sounded fantastic and santana did um but there were a couple of other acts on there and you could tell they were using lots of delay pedals and reverbs and that you couldn't hear the guitar play it just turned to mush you know um but the clarity you get when you make those decisions, you know, I think to kind of go, well, I don't need a lot of reverb. Look where I'm standing. I'm standing in a massive reverb tank. You know, if you want people to hear what you're doing, you don't want to be kind of smothering it in things which are just uh, losing that articulation. So um, anybody, anybody still out there? Or am I just talking to myself? <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, um, Doug Boyle. Anybody know where Doug is these days? Maybe he has a YouTube channel. Maybe he's playing with Beyonce. Who knows? Um, maybe he still plays with Robert Plant. I don't know. Let's get back in on this solo, will we? I don't want to get through this solo too quick. I'm trying to drag it out just for a bit of fun. You know. Um, there we go. There we go. So, I mean, if you're watching this later on, right, you just fast forward to later on where I've covered it all and you just watch me play the whole thing. You know what I mean? And probably, you know, if I if it takes me 45 minutes to get through this solo with all the chit-chat, um, you just skip forward to that. Um, and that's kind of fine. I think with the um, on the last video, because I was giving some opinions there, I th I'm starting to maybe divide uh, a few people in the, in the audience as well, which I don't kind of mind because I think you want that. You want to know how, what I think about things. Uh, you know, because I noticed there was a few mm, not... Uh, all positive kind of reactions to, to things but that's that's the reality isn't it of, um, of when you're speaking your mind and if you have a, an opinion on something um so anyway let's get back to this solo let's go up to where i was at which was one two three four <laughs> Did I do that lick? I can't remember. That's just a great lick, isn't it? So, um, okay. Um, then he goes to the first string, 19. He's got these two, you know, that's the ninth, isn't it? So he's bending up to the major third. You know what? I love that, that he's kind of, you know. You know, I don't know how that's sounding coming through the uh, 
coming because it's quite loud here. Um, but like the jump from like his resolve down on the root. So he's, and then he's going from the fourth string all the way up to the first string without a, without any thoughts or any. Um, there's no time. There's no rest or anything like that. You know, it's amazing how he goes from that lick and he ends here and then he jumps straight into a lick here and the they they just fit together perfectly. But they don't feel... Um, it's not like they're only like one fret away or just one string away. It's kind of like he has to jump over two strings to seamlessly carry on his lick. Um, maybe that's a really interesting thing to think about practicing when you're noodling with the blue scale is to maybe practice jumping... Uh, doing phrases and jumping over a couple of strings. So let me try that. So say I'm going. So what I was doing there was trying to end one phrase and then jump into another phrase, but actually don't make it where I am, so if I'm on the first string, jump to the fourth string, the start of the phrase, and then if that ends on the fifth string, start the next phrase on the second string. So you're doing big uh, jumps. That's quite an interesting concept, isn't it? Because it goes against your natural, what you're taught, um, maybe if you study music, is like the voice leading element, you know, where uh, things are quite close and they move in that kind of uh, thing. But actually disjointing them is another uh, uh, concept for being creative, isn't it? It's to kind of have more gaps between them. Uh, I'll try that one more time. So you got... Uh, uh. Definitely makes you makes you kind of work and create. For, I don't, you know, that I'm definitely playing for not stock stuff there. Or if it is kind of like stock, it's it's not in the the order that it new, usually rolls out of my fingers. So that's quite an interesting. See, you never know what you're going to come across <laughs> when you're working with these things. Um, okay, so we've just done the first string uh, nine. And then he goes more into the minor. And then. So all together, I mean, I'll take that that last lick down. So you get this. Um. So uh, in in the the complete chorus, if you like. happy with that there's a little phrase there that I uh, didn't completely uh, master but um you know there it is crossroads I'll do it again I might do it slow and then super fast like it is on the record don't know if this is a completely successful uh, stream not too many questions coming through there anybody um, out there I might uh, 
clip refresh on that just in case. Um, so what are you guys listening to? What should I, uh, what, you know, what's your favorite album? There's a kind of like a, in relation to the, you know, are we on the same string? It's because it doesn't really matter when an album is released anymore. You know, uh, there's still this thing of kind of like when you release an album, you have this kind of window of time to kind of promote it. Um, and then it's considered, well, you know, it's been out uh, six weeks, so it's old news, you know. But people kind of discover things in their own time much more now. And I, t I tend to do that as well. You know, I do that a lot with like Bruce Springsteen, actually. When he releases a new album, for some reason... It takes me ages to get around to listen to it. And I love uh, Bruce's songwriting and uh, his general albums. So it doesn't make sense. Why don't I just go and, you know, uh, but I think it's because I can listen to it when I'm in the mood. I, I do. And then generally when I do get around to listen to it, I really appreciate it and I really enjoy it. But I don't go to it just because it's new anymore. Probably same with uh, TV programs. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> So, you know, there's no people aren't really on the same string anymore. Nobody's talking about the same things all the time. You know what I mean? People aren't saying, oh, like the new, um, if, we, if we try and stick to the blues world, you know what I mean? Like, say, the new Joe Bonamassa album. Again, people, you know, will listen to it and discover it in their own time, even though, you know, there's a big push on it kind of promo-wise. People will, you know... Uh, discover that in their own times you find that people aren't talking about things in the same way you know um what are your thoughts on that are we on the same string because we really like learning guitar and things like eric Clapton solos i think we kind of are are we talking about it though you know um it's, is it but we kind of do it when we want to do it don't we we don't do it because uh there's only three channels on the telly and um there's what we you know we can only listen to music when we buy it and um, we can listen to whatever we want whenever we want now can't we we can consume media in, a, in in our own kind of ways you know um al al boozer uh love crossroads mike lee my favorite electric guitar recording of all time um uh, yeah it's pretty phenomenal isn't it when you think it's just a live hey lads let's do a version of crossroads you know that old uh, robert johnson we'll play our own riff though uh, you know, yesterday I did my version of Crossroads, didn't I? Because I, I basically, you know, I've played the, you know, the Clapton Cream style one for years on gigs, you know, and now I kind of tend to do it with my own kind of riff, you know, just because like, you know, hey, why not? You know, the world has, has heard, <laughs> you know, Clapton uh, do it and, you know, even Clapton changes it up, doesn't he? Um, I suppose some people really like to hear it note for note and other people kind of want you to, to express and do your own thing with things but um, uh, yeah but it's just a ferocious recording to think that it's live um, and the interplay between the three musicians is like it's so the fact that it kind of works there's three musicians and the vocal if you like just all kind of jamming and being that dynamic but it all knits together it's quite a rare thing to even play like that now is so dangerous sounding that you know you have to be in the right environment you can't even do that in a pub gig you know what i mean because it's so uh angry you know or it's quite you know the the energy behind it is so full on you know can you get away with it you know so uh unless you're in a blues club and you know you're you're uh but you might argue that you know it's quite intense and probably you know too intense for like a, a an audience which is kind of maybe softened over the years with you know um i think like a blues audience you know is now probably more conservative than ever you know um in what they're willing to you know listen to they like things kind of authentic and conservative and yet as soon as you start messing with things you know you you were kind of a target to um you know whereas in the 60s it was kind of like the opposite wasn't it you're taking these uh, classic old blues recordings and and revamping them up you know but now there's it's almost like you know like I was saying yesterday, the, the gentle, gentlemanly approach to things I'm not always completely at home with. I don't like the idea of people turning, 
rock and roll into a kind of like a suit and tie type of thing you know what i mean not none of it is written stone you can do whatever you want whenever you want with rock and roll that's the whole point as soon as people start making statements well this is the way it is you need to use the les paul when you're doing that song or uh, why aren't you on the neck pickup when you're playing Lenny or something like that? These are the kind of comments that you you get uh, when you know there's a there's a, a certain amount of kind of knowledge out there and people think it has to be a certain way when actually it doesn't. You can do whatever you want. That's the whole thing with rock and roll. And anybody who kind of starts to point towards the fact that it needs to be oh this is the way it's done and you need to use this amplifier and that's too much and that's too little. Um, uh i don't know i don't know i get that kind of makes me uh a bit worried you know i like the idea you know my, my the artists that excite me are the guys that just go and do their own thing even if it's you know crazy and 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 sounds a little bit um off the wall when it's uh when it's all safe and boring you know what i mean then you really have to worry you know okay here we go so i'll play it through another time i'll play it slow like a um and then i'll play it fast so one two fingers that and that was me doing it slow I wonder if I could do it all down the octave really good fun to do that what we're doing here by the way if you're just jumping in having your breakfast or um having your lunch if you're at work or something like that is uh, i'm teaching the last chorus of crossroads just for fun and you know what i might do tomorrow if i'm if i can do a live stream i might teach the chorus before that so you're learning it backwards it's not as crazy as it might sound you know everybody knows the front end if you know the back end really strong you know, um, you can meet in the middle and uh, it's actually a really good approach to learning solos and um, Charlie Parker tunes and things like that, actually. So, um, so okay, I'm going to sign off now because there's not many questions coming through. I don't know how many people are online. But anyway, for me, it's a really good... Um, this is a daytime stream, so you can see there's a lot more light. Um, audio wise, um, I'll have a listen back. How's the audio out there? Does it sound okay? So yeah, I think it's kind of uh, coming together, this live streaming. Probably needs to focus a little bit and maybe build up over time. Um, okay, so if you want to leave some comments, um, if you want to leave some comments and uh, if you've got any suggestions for topics to talk about, um, then maybe we'll, we'll make them a, a subject um, over the next uh, few days. Uh, Rift Digger. Thanks for supporting the channel, Rift Digger. Always uh, commenting and, and leaving positive vibes. I woke up this morning to find Mike live on my iPad YouTube. This is great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, no problem. Um, you know, uh, I'm going to try and do this over Christmas. And if I do a whole bunch of these, then I will be less uh, frightened of the idea of doing live streams every week. You know what I mean? It's a bit like kind of boot camp. Um, and, you know... It's kind of good fun to talk about stuff um, and rock and roll. Sounds great. Crank it. 
yeah. So um, what I've been trying to do is trying to get a nice rock sound, um, but just coming through one mic, I mean, I could go put the guitar into the interface, but I think it might sound a little bit too, yeah, a bit too kind of like close mic'd or something like that. I like the idea of you, baby, you guys hearing it in the same room that I'm kind of hearing it, you know. Um, so you're hearing the room sound and you hear them. So I've just got one mic right in front of me here, just picking up everything. But it's actually pretty loud, the guitar, but because the guitar is amp is facing that way and my voice is coming this way, I'm kind of hoping there's a nice uh, mix of the uh, the audio, you know, so. <laughs> So, uh, geez, uh, gets the heart going that, doesn't it? Keeps the uh, keeps the uh, the blood throwing through the the fingers. Um, okay, so uh, if you've got any any ideas for um, for uh, topics of uh, chat, um, today's subject that I was just talking about, are we on the same string? Which is a kind of a reference to a, a subject from the a podcast that I l listened to. Uh, um, which is the word in your ear where they were talking about uh, we're you know everybody's consuming media in lots of different ways so nobody's really listening to the same thing or if they are it, the time uh, element is all askew we're not listening to the same album because it came out this week we're not listening to the same program I suppose like you know everybody kind of watches the latest Netflix program or something like that Harry and Meghan thing was you know everybody's kind of watching that I have absolutely zero interest in that though so you know culturally that means nothing uh to me listening to a couple of uh people whinging and whining about their lives is not entertainment nor is it seem relevant about anything in my life so um like um even though we have all of this media to hand i spend more time surfing trying to find a program to watch in the evening and sometimes i think what am i even bothering looking through netflix there's nothing uh, here I'm interested in every now and then you'll get a little music documentary or you know there'll be uh, a, a series or something you might find but a lot of the time you're just kind of like you're just grazing on stuff aren't you so um, at least YouTube gives us that focus so even if there's you know um, there's so much great music guitar content you literally can't even consume all of that, you know. So every day I kind of come across different YouTubers and I go, geez, he's good. And look at that video. He's put a lot of time into that. Um, you know, so um, I'm always discovering great stuff uh, on YouTube. So at least we have that as guitar players. Um, because if we, if we were relying on TV and we didn't have the guitar community uh, on YouTube, geez, I'd... I, I don't know what I'd be kind of like uh, consuming, you know. So um, who are your favorite YouTube channels? Are there some that I should be checking out? Um, channels that are very close to mine, I tend not to watch. You know what I mean? I do like uh, I do like guitars. I like programs about amps a lot. Um, and I tend to tend to look up kind of gear um, that might... I might be interested in stuff like that. I like Pete Thorne's channel. He's really good. Um, I like watching his musical demos, the way he just uh, puts out kind of tunes and, and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot of similar guys out there, isn't there, kind of uh, demoing kind of gear. I'm not really that into pedals, though, so I, ne I don't really act on it. So even though he's kind of maybe demoing a pedal and it's all fantastic, the odds on me buying that pedal are pretty much uh, zero. I don't really, I'm not really into pedals. I really like guitars and amps. Uh, weirdly, I think I like amps more than guitars sometimes. If you look around here, there's quite a lot of amps. I probably need to uh, scale back on that. But uh, 
you know, I'm not sh exactly short on guitars, good quality guitars either. I think what I might do is pull out the Tyler tomorrow. What do you reckon? I haven't pulled out the Tyler much, but the um, that might be a good fun one to uh, to pull out. And actually, I, I forgot. I did pull out this guitar today. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll do a little play on that just before we, uh, we uh, finish up. This is my part caster guitar, and um, I bought all the parts off, like it's a warmest body and a warmest neck. And uh, you'll have seen it on videos, um, some of the Stevie Ray ones, Steve, Stevie Ray scrapbook ones. And um, it started its life out as a Fiesta Red parts caster. And uh, it originally was a, a, a humbucker with two single coils, James Tyler pickups. Um, and then over time, I got it painted by an artist friend of mine, Julie Potter. And uh, you'll see it on quite a few videos, you know. But it's really kind of cool. And, uh, it's like a Parisian cafe scene or something. You know, uh, and it's on the front of my Love Breaks the Fall album. See that painting up there? That was the original cover of the Love Breaks the Fall. And I'm standing on Rory Gallagher Corner with this guitar. So she painted me standing on Rory Gallagher Corner with a guitar that she painted. And then she painted the scene. And then I've used it as the album cover, the original one. Which is this. That's the CD. That's probably backwards or something, is it? No, no, it's fine. Um, so that's the painting that's kind of hanging behind me there. Um, some person who was like uh, trying to help me in my uh, musical career a few years ago said, oh no, you can't, that's not what you need to be doing. You, that album cover, that doesn't work. It's not crisp enough. You should do another one. And I, I kind of foolishly took that advice on board and I did another ver another release of that album with a with a different cover where I'm kind of leaning forward and, and doing that. I never really liked that one as much. And that, that just goes to show that people are trying to help sometimes, but they don't necessarily help. <laughs> you know, the expertise that people kind of like uh, give you in the music industry is kind of like pretty wobbly most of the time and I, I think if you you know if you listen to your own um you know your own voice and you consider things properly you're probably doing things right from the start you're probably writing the right chords and you're probably you know writing the right lyrics and using the right production if it's what you know you really uh really believe in um, usually what happens then people come along and say no you don't want to be doing it like this you want to be doing it like that and then it kind of like fucks it all up <laughs> but um, well intentioned advice sometimes just leads you off the path um, so anyway back to this guitar um, so it's a really cool guitar it's got at the moment it's got those Jesse Davey Bluebird pickups in and I put them in when I was going through a Steve Ray Vaughan phase a while back and I was doing a lot of scrapbook and it's got that tone switch in it so, shall I play that Clapton solo? Um, I'll do the bridge pickup, so. It's a lot brighter. Because of the net, the maple neck and the pickups, you know. Uh, but I can use the tone switch here, and if I roll it back one, you know, um, just kind of that's a, uh, a different 
what do you want to call it? It's kind of slightly different kind of high pass filter, I think, you know, and if I roll it back one again, it gets slightly darker. So you can take a lot of that top end off, you know. hearing a massive amount of difference on that today I wonder why that is um hi um oh it's my friend vladimir from russia nice to uh see you again thanks for hanging out i've been on online for a while i've been talking about all kinds of silly things and i'm just kind of riffing away with my mouth and riffing away with the guitar um i hope i'm not offending anybody or not saying too many uh talking too much shite um Lee, I wish I lived in between you and Johannes Sejborn. And yeah, I know him, um, so I could visit my two favorite YouTube channels in person. Well, that's very nice, Lee, for you to compare me to uh, uh, Johannes' uh, uh, YouTube channel, which is a brilliant uh, resource for speakers and amps and marshals and stuff like that. And you can see I am a big uh, marshal kind of fan. I have. What Marshalls do I have? I have I have a 2061 X, which is like a, a lead bass and a cab, the matching cab. I have a, the 1974 X combo and the matching extension cab. I have a, a reissue super lead, which is just out of camera there, but you'll see it all the time on the channel, the 4x12. And then I have this uh, 1973, uh, which are kind of like a, a Zilla cab there, which has got two... Uh, is a two by 12. Um, so that's a, a super lead, but it's kind of more of a metal panel. It's uh, whereas my, my other super lead is like a plexi. So there are, that one is a little bit more aggressive sounding uh, than, uh, than the, the, the plexi one. The plexi is really good for taking to a, a like I say, a big uh, function gig. Cause you've got so much headroom, but it still has a martial flavor to it. And then you, all you need is some kind of like overdrive to give it a little bit of, something um so it's not you know completely clean if you're doing some of the rocky stuff but um with the gretch and the and the plexi it's even for just like you know just for the clean headroom um and you might go well, what's the point if it's that that clean it still has character it still has something as a width of sound a super lead that uh, just makes it sound massive so if i do kind of like Mizaloo, you know dick dale or something through the super lead and a tube screamer it just sounds enormous but then if you do that with maybe the 1974x the one by 12 and it's an 18 watt it doesn't it doesn't doesn't have it's a more contained kind of sound you know um so it's nice to uh uh you know it's kind of nice to have those options like i've got a gig tonight and i'll take the 1974x because it's the, i know the venue is pretty small uh, in comparison to maybe where I'd use, uh, um, actually, I keep the, the the Friedman small box a lot in the car. <laughs> I don't really unload it, um, so I use that on most of the gigs. But the venue I'm playing tonight, I I don't really want to be uh, bringing in the small box to be honest. I'll, and the cab, I'll probably just bring a combo in because I know there's not going to be a lot of room on that stage, you know. Um, hey, Paul from Japan, great to see you live, Mike. Hey, no problem. I hope your move is going well uh, back to Japan um, from Shanghai. Um, yeah, great. To, great. Thanks for um, um, uh, commenting. It's really nice if you just drop something into the top chat. It kind of knows that people are there and, and people are kind of watching and stuff. Uh, so uh, I was just talking about this guitar, wasn't I? <laughs> if this has nines on I can't actually tell but I really like this guitar and I this guitar is 10 years old because um, on my 40th birthday um, basically my wife um, kind of this was my present for my 40th birthday so uh 
my 50th will be in March. So um, I expect another guitar then, I suppose. You know, because, hey, what else is there? Uh, I suppose I could go on a fancy holiday or, I don't know, get something practical. But, um, so... Um, uh, it's a really nice guitar. Like I said, it started off like a, fi a Fiesta Red. So if you take the scratch plate off, you'll see, you know, the uh, it, uh, behind the scratch plate. There's a, f but the Fiesta Red that I got from Warmoth, was it a good Fiesta Red? It was okay. It was just on the airing on the side of a little bit too pink for real Fiesta Red. And Fiesta Red is kind of pinky, but there's it's really hard to get that Fiesta Red color right. And I would. I'd still love to have a Fiesta Red um, uh, Strat, you know. Um, um, Jacob Miller. Um, good day from Australia. Uh, loving the old Beano lesson. Thanks, Mike. I love revisiting those. Me too. Um, I I feel like I should go back and maybe relearn Double Crossing Time or... Um, you know, any of those uh, rambling on my mind and, and stuff like that, um, you know, because that's our bark. That's our Mozart, isn't it? That's the, you know, if we're into blues rock, um, then, uh, you know, it doesn't really get that much better. All you have to do is keep practicing that and making it your own. And you've got like a, a whole lifetime's worth of stuff to be uh, goofing around with. Um, you are cool as always. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Uh, Paul, as a Clapton fan, do you think his he sound better with a Strat or a Gibson? <sighs> He's almost like two two or three different artists in my mind. Um, because he's been around so long, I would never expect an artist to just keep doing one thing. You know what I mean? I think it's kind of like some people who say, you know, he should still be playing, you know. I like the fact that he's kind of evolved and changed. You know, he was a, you know, a blues purist and then he was like a fusion head and then it was all about the songs and Derek and the Dominoes. And then he got into like country and, he, you know, laid back stuff. And then he was a pop artist again in the 80s. And then he went back to his roots in the 90s and now he just does his own things. He's completely his own man, he, you know, uh, but he still rips it. And if people who say he don't, he doesn't rip it. And not watching the footage. If you watch him, you know, for 77, um, he's still ripping it. And, you know, if you've got a problem with how he's playing now at 77 and you're watching the footage and you're actually listening and watching it properly, you, you know, there's some, you know, I wouldn't be criticizing any 77 year old for playing like that. Um, and I like the fact that he changes. And I think I would see that. I don't want to be kind of too like wishy washy or anything, but it's nice that we have those different areas that we can tap into because he's a multi colored, uh, faceted kind of like artist. So if we want that heavy cream thing, we've got it there. If we want that poppy thing, we've got it there from the 80s. So it's kind of nice. Does he? I I really love his sound on the on the cream stuff and Derek. But the Derek and the Dominoes album is my favorite, and that's him playing the Strat, isn't it? So it's hard for me to kind of say definitively. I think it's like um, I I chop and change. You know, sometimes when he's playing a Strat, you kind of go, it's you know, you kind of go, would that be nicer on a Les Paul? Sometimes I do think, ooh. I'd like to have heard him play that on a Les Paul. But, like, he didn't. He played it on the Strat, and it was still really cool. So, like, who am I to say, you know? Um, one thing I do, obviously, talk about a lot is that time I went to see Clapton in, you know, 1987, I think, you know. It was just after that year of that broadcast one of the the 1986 with Phil Gen uh Greg Fillingaines and Nathan Easton, Phil Collins, you know, that... Uh, video uh, that you see uh, online and I watched that the tube special it was as it was broadcast back then and I saw him in 87 the year later and he came out the first song he played was Crossroads on a Les Paul you know and he came out in that same way that he does does on that 86 video you know and I was right on the barrier and he walked straight in front of me and stood right there and it was like the light was shining behind his head and I was like probably 13, 14 at the time. And uh, yeah, so, ah, 
kind of moments, you know, um, definitely has an impact on you over time, that doesn't it? But yeah, he played a Gibson then, and then he's flipped onto his kind of like, you know, strat with the EMGs kind of thing. But that still sounds epic to me, you know. Um, I don't get too picky about it. I know some people have a problem with it, but it's kind of like, I'm trying, you know, the gear isn't that important. It's kind of like how emotive it is and, and what it's trying to communicate. You know, and if it succeeds in communicating the right emotion, who gives a shit, like, if he's using EMGs or, uh, you know, it's kind of like, it doesn't really matter, does it? You know, we've be, we've become quite um, over, over-invested in, I think, on a lot of that uh, that stuff. Um, so, anyway, thanks for the question, Paul, but I'd, I'd say all of it. I love it all. I love it when he plays acoustic. I love it when he, yeah, what else does he play? He doesn't. What a um, three three five on the on the uh, from the cradle kind of stuff. Uh, student let me the DVD of that and the, the, excellent. You know it's great to kind of watch. Um, okay, Lee, when you received your Warmoth replacement neck, did you have to do any work on it, or was it ready to play out of the box? Well, what I did is um, I got all the parts and I um, I put them in a box and then I took it to John Moriarty and I said, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he he screwed it all together, and um, so I bought the neck and the body from uh, Warmoth. So it meant that the you know the the fit was good. Um, I know he had to do a lot of work, not a lot of work, but he had to do work on the guitar, the frets to finish the frets, and to 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 bring it up to the uh, you know the level that I would have hoped for like a, a guitar which essentially cost me for a parts caster it still cost me a grand to to buy and by the time it came in with duty and stuff like that and then you know i had to pay john to you know for his time and stuff like that so easily cost maybe probably between a grand and 1200 quid this guitar you know um but uh it's a fabulous guitar you know what i mean and i will never sell it because it's a it's a it's a personal item as well because it's personally connected to that album the love breaks the fall and my wife bought it for my 40th so there you go it's a great it's, it's nice uh what i like doing is i do actually use it as a bit of an experiment guitar where i swap out the pickups you know what i mean and that keeps my soldering chops up which is kind of good fun as well and i like these bluebird pickups you know the the they seem to work well you know and like all guitars it does it feels very very different to the the custom shop you know what i mean it can't ever sound like the custom shop completely so it's nice to have um so strat wise you know i've got that the custom shop 59 style um with and they just that just has texas specials in it but i would never swap the pickups out and that, that guitar's fine this doesn't need any 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 swapping out of anything um and then this being a, a parts caster i could put a humbucker back in that if i wanted i could um it's got a maple neck so it's got a spankier slightly tighter brighter sound um so um you know, it's a, it is a different sounding kind of beast. If I wanted to, to make a, an SSH out of it, I could. Uh, no big deal. Um, but I do have the James Tyler as well, which I would consider my modern, you know, guitar. So if I if I was doing a gig and it had to be, um, if if the set that I was I had to play was very tight and modern, maybe modern country rock kind of gig or maybe a poppier singer-songwriter thing, that Tyler would work really well for that. Um, it's got a very clean, uh, modern kind of sound to it. So basically I've got three three strats, um, but I think they're different enough to uh, warrant having having them, you know. Um, uh, Captiva, I don't know how you say it. Oh, no, I've skipped over one. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, a little bit of work, work had to be done, but like I would probably, you know, I don't, I think you pro could probably have got away with it. It would have been just like an American standard or something, because even an American standard, you would have to do work on it to bring it up. And I think that's the what you could compare it to. But because like John Moriarty is a great luthier, you know, he, he kind of sees things and he, you know, made sure that it was all aligned and the neck was, you know, uh, you know, it was all it was all in good shape. Um, so 
uh, what was going to say so wally j tuning in from north carolina usa thank you for the great videos been checking them out for some time and they've been great resource I've learned a lot from your teaching. Thank you very much, Wally J. Um, that's great to have that feedback. You know, every time somebody says that, I'm kind of back in the game. Um, every time someone thumbs a video down, I get really kind of like, oh, what am I doing this? And even, it only takes one thumb down. Like somebody thumbed down the last live stream and I was like, what did I say? Did I offend someone? I hope I didn't. And um, not that I'm afraid of offending someone. I just want to make sure that um, I'm giving you, um, you know, I'm giving you a, a, a valuable perspective and uh, kind of informed uh, viewpoint on the, on blues rock and how I see it. It's not necessarily how you have to see it, um, or how I see YouTube and how I see my channel, how I like to play, um, how I like to write music, all of that kind of stuff. But obviously, you can't please everybody. So um, to that person who thumbed down the video, please don't. Just go off and watch something else. Um, so, yeah, if you do, you know, every time someone leaves a positive comment, it really means a lot. And you hear a lot of YouTubers say that. And it's actually so true. And you you might be listening to it going, yeah, sorry. The people have leave comments like that all the time. But it's um, it definitely keeps uh, the motivation up. Uh, hey, Mike, great to see you. Greetings from the U.S., up early to watch you. That's Captiva. Um, Captiva tuning also from uh, North Carolina. Great to see you. Uh, great to see you, Wally J. So uh, you have to tell us the secret to how you get your wife to buy you a guitar. <laughs> mm, don't know. Um, I suppose I'm. It's an easy win. You know, it's expensive, but uh, I suppose she knows I'll be happy. <laughs> you know um i suppose not everybody has a hobby stroke uh career you know forget the career element but not everybody has what we have which is a passion for this plank of wood or a couple of pieces of wood screwed together with strings across it and it's such a valuable thing you should never underestimate the um never underestimate the value that this can bring to your life where it can be it can focus your mind um, it can take you out of bad times it can bring you to good times um, there's life lessons in learning music isn't it because we know the learning curve is so you know shallow is that the right word you know it's not like you know you pick up one guitar guitar one day and you're a rock star the next there's obviously exceptions to that you know when you see footage of Derek Trucks when he's 12 or something or some Korean classical guitar player or something there's always exceptions but um for most of us we you know to improve by one percent might take six months work um but that's the zen game that's you know you've heard me say that before the zen game of learning music you know it's a character building experience isn't it um so there is no secret i suppose she she knows how happy the guitar makes me and uh, i'm very lucky to have uh you know enough work to kind of stay a, a professional guitar player and it's you know it's not the um it's not easy obviously post covid and all that kind of stuff but you know if you that's another reason to have a youtube channel to kind of promote your your thing isn't it and keep writing music and keep working with different artists and stuff like that um jacob miller uh, instead of revisiting beano how about touching on cream to derek and the dominoes uh, please haha -ha. um i warm up on all your love through my 100 watt plexi every time it moves the fingers and the heart yeah i mean that's the do you use a, an attenuator or do you use a, like a like this which is like a what's it called again it's a fryette power station that's what i use with with this uh, 100 watt super lead and um, with the other one i use it more like a clean uh, thing and then put a tube screamer in front of it but it still it still has a character um it's not like an anemic clean channel on a uh, an amplifier it still has that martial character you know um so how do you jacob do you use a, an attenuator or do you use an overdrive to 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 get it where you need it to go 
Um, that'd be interesting to know if you what you do there, um, and what do other people do? Do, do uh, what do you do to get that kind of like um, that Beano sound? Do you have a JTM forty five or a Blues Breakers amp, um, or do you just have a like? Generally, what I'm doing here is I've got like my uh, PV Mini Colossal, <laughs> you know, five watt amp, and I've got the Friedman Golden Pearl. Uh, which is just like a boost pedal, which has got a bit of gain on it. It's not. It's a real low, super low gain uh, boost pedal, but um, it's a, it, it still it makes it sound like an amp overdriving. It doesn't sound like a pedal, and that's what I like about it. It's almost uncomfortable, and I don't know if that makes any sense to people, but you know, it's got the. It gives a sound where it's kind of like it sounds like an amp, which is like hot. It doesn't sound like a pedal, which is kind of just EQ'd everything really, really beautifully. I find a lot of the time when I go to play live and you, you go to play with that sound, you just disappear in the mix. So um, I've, I, I kind of, my sound a lot of the time can be quite spiky and a bit uh, aggressive, but quite clean clean and aggressive at the same time it's not never overly overdriven i don't think uh jacob earplugs and some old pre-roller greenbacks uh nearly wide open clon clone with the plexi jtm 4500 uh kt 66 quad wow there's a lot of information there in just three lines of of text amazing that you put that much of information uh, people are so so clued into everything now you know i mean that there's a thesis in that three line comments um earplugs you know uh i use earplugs uh on gigs as well because you kind of have to I, some gigs i don't uh, some of my own gigs uh, i don't i find that uh if i'm singing a lot of backing vocals on gigs that helps me pitch as well <laughs> um i have in ears as well sometimes i use them but a lot of time i don't bother setting them up for some reason i um maybe i should go through that setup actually the, my multiple live choices i basically take a big box with me of cables and bits and bobs and when i'm on the gig i can evaluate and go is this don't need earplugs tonight i need earplugs tonight i need in ears tonight i basically make that decision on the fly as we go along um and then so the next part of your uh, some old pre-roller greenbacks you know i don't even know what that is i know that the speakers pre-roller i actually don't want don't know what that means so i'll i'll be educating myself together t uh, today on that on that you know uh greenbacks you know I'm a big fan of the greenbacks. I have them in the 4x12 and in my 1974 X and extension cab. Uh, what, are, what is in the 2061 X? I think that's two. I think, actually, there might be two vintage 30s in that one, actually. Or is the greenbacks? I can't remember. I might open it up and have a little look. Um, uh, the, the cab that I use a lot with the uh, the Friedman has uh, two sixty five watt Celestian, um, and they're they're really good. They're, that's just I don't speakers. I'm not an expert at all. Um, I I hear a big difference between Greenbacks and other speakers. That's what I uh, Greenbacks have a real kind of quality. Then you have all the other speakers which have different ranges of. Uh, more of a clean and clarity to them but i like the way greenbacks kind of break up a bit earlier and are a little bit more rock and roll and then all the others seem to kind of i don't really know a huge difference um i couldn't articulate the difference between all the different speakers um i do have uh, red backs in the uh in the my purple cab there um so this the super high watt and efficient kind of speakers and i w really wanted one cab which was super efficient like that you know um because the others are, are using kind of lower watted speakers it'd be just nice to have uh that option you know um nearly wide open clon clone so that sentence there is kind of you know that's your pedal isn't it which is providing a good bit of gain um with the plexi jtm 45 stroke 100 watts so is it is that that you have both? You have a JTM45 and you have a 100 watt super lead? 
Uh, and then you've got the KT-66s, which is what you get normally in a, in a JTM-45, isn't it? Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, amazing setup there. Awesome. Um, I'd love to, if, you, if you've got a, you know any footage of you playing that, drop it in the chat and we can all go and have a look and listen and see how the uh, how it sounds, you know. But I love a Marshall and, you know, uh, I just... Uh, I don't really have a clone clone at the moment. I've had to them before, but I'm I must uh, look into getting some a good. Uh, what would you all recommend? Best clone clone. Let me know. Um, I should probably have one, shouldn't I? Uh, Captiva. Am I saying that right? Captiva sounds cool. Captiva. Um, you're right. Life as a guitarist is a journey and brings value to improve yourself. Thanks for making your videos and lessons. You're an inspiration. Well, thank you very much. That warms my heart for you to say such a thing. Um, you know, would I advise anybody to go into the guitar game? <laughs> um, definitely have it as a hobby. Um, the ways of making money through music is very, very, you know, you have to be creative as a guitar player musically, but you have to be creative as a, as a business person as well, I think, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, thanks for saying that. I appreciate that. Um, Paul uh, was saying, highly recommend Mike's private lessons. Yeah, Paul, we've studied, um, or Paul studied with me for uh, quite a long time and you know uh, uh we've done covered a lot of stuff haven't we over the years um and had a lot of fun exchanging videos you know i do video i do kind of internet lessons but the way it works with my internet lessons is um i send we we talk via email you know and we kind of establish some kind of goals and then the student buys like four lessons and what i do is i record a lesson which is based on those goals that we've talked about and say here's what i want you to practice and it can be generally kind of technique based things depending on your stage of development and then maybe a, a practical solo that we want to learn to to learn the skills of um you know solo and string bending and phrasing and things like that um chords uh you know maybe the theory which we can work into the technical side of things so that might video might be about 20 minutes long which is a good length for a video i think a uh, lesson video because you don't want it too long because you kind of can't find things when you're going back through it and then the student sends me a video back and they say hey mike here's me playing my um you know solo from you know we might be working on i don't know uh eric clapton say you know and um and then they play the technical exercises and then i return the video and i say hey don't use your little finger so much use your third finger when you're bending to get the vibrato you know i can give some tips visually as well as hourly and uh, and then you complete the four lessons and then we keep going until you reach your goals um and it's a really good fun way of uh learning you know uh, and i did a very similar thing with charlie benacos for nine years between like 2000 one 2009 and i studied kind of jazz with charlie benacos if you're not aware of who he is just google charlie benacos and he was like a great pianist um and we used to send cassette tapes across to each other so i'm in dublin and i get a cassette tape and i'll be like great here's my lesson and i'll listen to it on the cassette and then i flip the tape over and then i'd practice it for two weeks and then i press play and record and then i go hey charlie here's my exercises and here's the piece that i wrote and then we go backwards and forwards, round and round like that, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you're interested in those lessons, you, you can find links on my website and, you know, buy them through PayPal. There is an option as well where you can do the four lessons. And at some point during those four lessons, and we have a two-week turnaround for each lesson, we can do a little Skype where we talk. Um, but it's more like a consultation. We don't. I don't like teaching people through Zoom or Skype. It's kind of like it's not much fun because you lose you can't play together you may as well talk through issues and harmony problems and understanding the guitar neck and stuff like that um, you know i talk a lot about learning music through intervals knowing the notes on the guitar and knowing intervals you know knowing where the root is where's the fifth where's the third where's the flat seven you know and this is where a lot of people kind of tune out because they go well I don't want to know about all that stuff, but they do want to know how a G 
tube screamer is built or something like that. And I'm the opposite. I don't care how a tube screamer is built, but I, w- I want to know about the inner workings of music. I, that's my that's my job. It's actually to create the music. It's not my job to create the technology, <laughs> uh, like the pedals and stuff. But there is a kind of a funny thing at the moment. People are so, so clued into the the technical side of things, aren't they, you know? Uh, Wally J, ever consider doing some deeper dives into Freddie King's influence on Clapton's style? Yeah, we should do that. And I was actually thinking of actually me learn with some of these live streams where I might just pull up a piece of music and I'll kind of like work it out in real time and then teach it you in real time. And then we talk about it and stuff like that. And that, that's a kind of an insight into kind of seeing how I work stuff out. And then because we'll be focusing very specifically on one piece or even just one lick, then, you know, if we talk about that lick for an hour and we just really push and pull it around and drag it through the dirt and do it forward and backwards and inside out that will stick with you it'll stick in your musical brain and it'll stick in your fingers and that's the kind of intense kind of thing you need to do when you're practicing you know um the more information you try to work through the the less you probably will stick you really need to take the smallest amount of information you can bear and kick it around as much as possible and then you're much more likely to uh to to get benefits from it so um hey thanks for joining me i think i might wrap up now because and i'll be back tomorrow uh, even though it's christmas eve i'm going to try and do a cheeky little uh um uh, live stream just to just because it's a learning experience for me and i really want to make sure that um you know uh that I'm I'm kind of moving forward in this. I think a daylight session, the quality of the video is <laughs> I can see the the it's a cleaner looking video, but that isn't always possible. And like I was saying there, I might do some late night sessions where I might come in here at two o'clock in the morning, which would be, you know, kind of maybe eight o'clock at night where you are and if you're in the States. And that might be a, a more friendly time. Um I don't know what my energy levels would be like at that time, but you know so what or i could do a really early one i could come in here at six and that'd be midnight for you guys or whatever but anyway uh thanks to everybody that's kind of been in the top chats and um please leave a comment and um you know this this is all well intentioned you know i i hope that some of the opinions and uh the way that i think about music and and what i'm kind of doing here is is helpful to you in some way i don't mean to be disrespectful if it, if i speak out of turn um i have a lot of respect for my fellow youtubers uh but i don't necessarily want to do things the same as them or necessarily um think that it's uh, uh, beneficial for me but it may be very very beneficial for you to watch um so uh enjoy youtube it's much better than flicking around netflix um and uh keep it burning i'll play a little bit of something what shall i play um how about a Thanks, Al. Keep rocking yourself. Thanks, Simon. Um, 
Lee, thank you for your time and energy, love. Uh, your channel, thank you very much, Lee. Keep it burning, guys, and uh, look out for the the notifications on the streams and uh, jump back in if you can. Jump in if you can, you know. Um, this this stream started off very very quiet, and then actually because you guys all jumped in um, over the last uh, 40 50 minutes or something like that, it's really made it so. Thanks a bunch for making it uh, 